is a song of date. How many of you have been a Seventh-day Adventist baptized member for 50 years or more? <clears throat> 50 years or more? Six. Almost. I just wanted to let you know that this coming Thursday I will have been baptized as a Seventh-day Adventist for 50 years. This coming Thursday. November the 8th, 1968. <laughs> and what a joyful 50 years that has been. We are a blessed people, aren't we? And you know, we're a special church. We are a special church. Somebody's not hearing me back there. Do I have enough volume? <clears throat> okay, all right. Um, you know, we are not Seventh-day Lutherans. We're not Seventh-day Anglicans. We're not Seventh-day Presbyterians. We're not Seventh-day Baptists. We're Seventh-day Adventists. Amen. We're a church with God's last day message. And we're living in a, in a challenging time in this world today, and such as we have never witnessed before in the history of this world. And uh, before I begin with our message, I want us to have another word of prayer together. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, again, we come before you as we are now in our worship hour, this beautiful Sabbath day. Lord, we pray that your, minds are, that, that your mind will be in ours today, that we'll keep them fixed on you as we study this most important subject. Lord, fill me with your spirit. Fill all of us with your spirit, Lord. Give us your understanding and clarity as we open your holy word and as we study the subject of the hour, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Make sure I don't have mine on. <laughs> okay. Okay. <clears throat> Facebook Christians. Sounds like an interesting subject or not? Facebook Christians. I want you to come with me to the book of 1 Chronicles, chapter 16. 1 Chronicles 16. <clears throat> Communication in the world today has evolved from cave carvings to smoke signals to the beating of drums to telegraph and Morse code back in the mid-1800s. And then in the year 1876, there was a, by, a man by the name of Alexander Graham Bell who invented the telephone. Some just, it, it was a marvelous instrument. Soon thereafter, we had come from the telephone, though, I mean, well, from landlines to wireless. But now everybody has a cell phone. Well, cell phone's even antiquated now. I've, I've got one, though. That's all I use is my cell phone so I can make a phone call. Or, you know, iPads or smartphones or whatever, or whatever they call them now. Uh, but uh, they've got uh, these things that, that you could communicate around the world anytime and at any place. And, and it's a wonderful tool. It can be useful. It can be useful, I'm sure. And now we can actually see the communicant with which we're talking in real time. That is unbelievable. If my father were to be resurrected right now and see what's going on, he'd, he'd think, what world am I in? You know. You can actually see the person you're talking to on your mobile phone. And now, of course, texting has, is a way of life now. I mean, nobody knows how to talk to anybody. They're afraid to, I think, so they just text them. It's a way to communicate without having to speak to anyone, see. And just tell them what you want to say, not what they want to say. Or face to face with the other party. 
you know, with all this amazing technology, we've really not jumped forward. We have really lost the most important, the most powerful, the most meaningful form of communication. And it's not found on a mobile phone. I'm talking about real FaceTime. I'm not talking about an app. The truth is the enemy of souls has used these gadgets to rob us of FaceTime with our families. And as a result, we have left, we've left many people isolated and lonely. You might be thinking now, Pastor Dan, where are you going with this? <laughs> well, let's start with First Chronicles, First Chronicles chapter 16, and we'll start with verse 8. <clears throat> First Chronicles 16, verse 8. Give thanks unto the Lord, call upon His name, make known His deeds among the people. Sing unto him, sing psalms unto him. Talk you of all his wondrous works. Glory you in his holy name. Let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. So, we're to seek his face. How often? Continually. Continually. 2 Chronicles 7, 14, you don't need to turn there. You know it already. If my people were called, that were called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive them of their sins and heal their land. And then Psalms 106, 105, verse 4 says that we seek him forevermore. Well, how do we do that? How do we seek his face? Come with me to Revelation chapter 1. <clears throat> One of the most powerful ways to seek his face is by reading his book. Let's look at verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. <laughs> Matthew 24, 15 also says, Whoso readeth, let him understand. So we're to read it, we're to hear it, or understand it, and then we are to keep it. The prophet Habakkuk in chapter 2 of Habakkuk the Lord said to his prophet in verse 2, Write the vision and make it plain upon the tables that he may run that readeth it. He may run that readeth it. So we seek his face continually. We read his book. We keep it. And we run with it. This is what I call a Facebook Christian. And I think you'll agree with me that I think we need more Facebook Christians. And I think you'll agree with me that we need more Facebook Christians. Thank you. <laughs> you know, it's amazing to me how a man can, or a woman can, or a young person can sit in, a, in well, it, not a young person, how a man or a woman can sit in church for years and years and hear the truth week after week and year after year and still not know black from white, still not know truth from error. This is a clear indication that this individual is not seeking face time with the Lord. It's clear that he's not spending prayerful time reading the book. Romans chapter 14 verse 12 tells us that every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Romans chapter 14 verse 12. Every one of us shall give account to God. Now we have some students here, don't we? We might have some students here. Or all of us should be students, so shouldn't we? But you know when you're in school or in college or whatever, you have examinations, don't you? You have examinations, and you have to give an account of how much time you've spent seeking or reading. And each one of us must give account to the government. Every April, do we not? Every April we've got to give an account to the government. And a salesman has to give an account of his sales at the end of every week. And you and I must give account of the way in which we spend our lives. We're going to have to give an account. 
And without proper accountability, we revert back to the, the last verse in the book of Judges. You know what that says? That where every man was doing that which was right in his own eyes. And someone says, Pastor Dan, you know, it all depends on how you look at that. Well, in reality, it depends on how God looks at it and what he says about it. But we human beings, we depend on each other's faces as a vital uh, part of our communication. Don't you agree? It's an important source of information as we look in another's face. There's an old saying that the, the eyes are the windows of the soul. You can read a lot in someone's eyes. And we know that babies are attracted by human faces. Isn't that true? We've got a new one right back here. Well, I don't know where the mother is right now, but we've got a new one right back here, haven't we? And, uh, you know, these babies, you, you all have been there. Most of you have had, those of you that have had little ones, how the baby just looks up in that loving, with that loving little face and this trust. You can see the trust. You can see it right in his eyes and that little smile. It, it, it's, it's just a beautiful thing, isn't it? I remember when our children were born. That was such a, a, a precious thing. So face, faces are, are very, very vital and important to human communication. It's in, is it any wonder then why when Moses came down from the mount talking to God that his face was transformed into a, 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 a beacon of radiant light? Beloved, there's nothing more precious than a radiant glowing presence in your countenance. Have you ever experienced it? Have you ever felt the presence of a real life FaceTime with God? I mean, after a time, a second time, you remember Moses came down after going up the, the mountain the second time, bringing down God's law, and he had a, a, a special glow on his face. I mean, heaven's light was reflected from the countenance of Moses. I mean, after all, he had spent how many days up there in his presence? Forty days. He said, Forty days. It seemed like some of it rubbed off on him. This day with God, page 75. This day with God, 75, says this. Now is the time for every church member to say, I will close my heart to everything that would hinder my communication with Christ. I will open the windows of my soul heavenward that I may understand spiritual things. Let us seek the Lord that we may learn how to work His works in the world. This will make us successful missionaries able to help others to a hopeful, courageous experience. And then God's Amazing Grace, page 67. Another quote. She says, God does not accept men because of their capabilities. Believe me, He didn't accept me because of my capabilities. I know that for sure. But because they seek His face desiring his help. God sees not as man sees. He judges not from appearances. He searches the heart and judges righteously. Ah, seek the Lord in his strength and seek his face continually. You know, God wants real face time with you and I. And you and I need face time with God. When is the last time you've had face time with God? You know, we get so busy in our lives, don't we? And we fail to take that face time with God. You know, I'm talking about, I'm talking about undistracted time. Quiet time. I'm talking about undivided time. Face to face, heart to heart communication with God. How many of you ever, have ever gotten a text message from God? All of you have. Yeah. That's right. The irony of it all is he sent all of us the text. Quite long and exhaustive, in fact. And most of you have it right now in your hand or either in your lap. It contains 66 books which God has inspired, which portrays his great love for each one of us. Beloved, the world is looking at Facebook. But what they don't realize is they need to be looking at for Facebook Christians. And they need to. They don't even know it. But they, they need Facebook Christians. 
Those who are seeking his face, those who are reading his book. Minister of Healing, page 132. You don't mind if I quote from, from the, the prophet of God, do you? No, I do. Thank you. There is nothing that the world needs so much as a knowledge of the gospel's saving power revealed in Christ-like lives. I tell you, the more I read of that lady, the more I, there is no doubt in my mind that God has called her to a special office. No doubt. Come with me to Romans 8 now. <clears throat> Romans chapter 8 and verse 19. It says here in verse 19, the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. You know what that's saying? All creation. People are out here. They're, they're waiting eagerly for somebody to show them where God's children are. The church is supposed to represent Jesus to the world. Let me ask you, when the church, or, or when the world looks at the church, what does it see? Do they see Facebook Christians? What I mean is, do, do they see a people who seek God's face and read His book? Do they see in your face and in my face attention to their needs? Compassion for their hurts? Do they see people who, uh, who have joy for their victories? Do they see people who, who have concern for their challenges and their problems? Forget your own. You don't have any. God's managing yours today, remember? Talked about that this morning, didn't I, briefly? Do they see a listener? A quiet listener? Who is slow to respond? You know, sometimes we're so quick. Oh, I've got the answer for you. Do they see a radiance of a mind that is filled with peace and joy? Do they see love reflecting from your face and my face when, when, when we're in contact <clears throat> with the world? Beloved, there's no doubt in my mind that when you do this and you do it consistently, the sin-sick heart will rejoice to be in your company. Not only the sin-sick heart, but the hurting, lonely, and discouraged heart. In seeking His face and reading His book, we become partakers of holiness. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14. We're told there in Hebrews 12, 14, that we are to be partakers of holiness, without which no man can see God. So nothing less than holiness is acceptable to God. Why do we get this idea? I mean, think many Christians think that they're, they're accepted of God regardless of their condition. You see, when we diligently seek His face and read His book, we become partakers of the divine nature and we're set apart for a special work, for a soul-saving work. And without the, the indwelling of this spirit in your heart daily, we're left in a deplorable condition. I mean, we're weak and we're despondent. We become disheartened. You have little control of your mind and are unable to do that which is right. Ever been there? I have. There are many souls out here deep in a world of sin. Many souls that are hurting. Many souls that are lonely. And they're looking and waiting desperately. Might be your neighbor looking desperately to witness a demonstration of what the gospel can do for him or her. 
And when he sees that demonstration, hope springs up in his heart. And this hope brings about a transformation of his heart. And justification now becomes a reality to him. Justification. And the process of restoration and sanctification then can take place in his life, you see. What a beautiful, what a beautiful plan God has made. It's, it's beautiful. It's like a disabled ship, you know, being towed into port. It's safe, but it's not sound. There's repairs that need to be made to that ship before it's pronounced seaworthy. And the man needs to be restored, repaired, before he's completely restored. You see, God's final demonstration through the last generation will be the very demonstration for which the world has been looking. And I want to be a part of that demonstration, don't you? Amen. You know, the little Israelite maid there in 2 Kings Chapter 5 presents to us a wonderful, wonderful ministry of a true Facebook Christian. Being a captive there to the Syrian uh, uh, commander-in-chief of the Syrian army, she, she was an exemplary child of the living God. I mean, she could have been resentful, couldn't she? She could have felt that her life was unfair. She could have, she could have made his life unpleasant or everybody that she was around. That's what most individuals would probably do in the same situation. But not this little girl. Not this little girl. I mean, she could have, she could have uh, had excuses for not witnessing. Or she could have said, I'm not old enough. I don't know enough. And no one will pay attention to me. I'm not sure I should do anything. But she bravely shared her faith. And listen, don't miss this. Because her life was so consistent, her master believed what she said. Don't forget that. Because her life was so consistent, Sam will believe what you said. I'm sorry, that just popped into my mind. You know, this is an extremely important point. We can believe and embrace the truth of the sanctuary, the Seventh-day Sabbath, all the other wonderful things that we learn from the Word, but the results will only bring, bring fruit for the kingdom when our lives demonstrate the power of those beliefs. Now, I believe that she was sharing the power of her beliefs. That's why he's still interested. You see, he's still interested. And another point that I'd like to share is that even a weak, uh, inadequate instrument, apparently can be blessed by God to produce outstanding results. I know that for a fact because I'm a weak, inadequate instrument. Out of the last generation, God will select His chosen ones. He will select the, the, the faithful, the loyal, the obedient, the common, ordinary people. And through them and by them, He will make that demonstration. You see, God permits Satan in the last generation to try His people to the utmost. They will be threatened. They will be tortured. They will be persecuted. They will stand face to face even with death in the issuance of the decree to worship the beast in his image. We know that, don't we, from Revelation 13, don't we? But they will not yield. They would be willing to die rather than to sin. Beloved, do you truly realize or understand the implications of enlisting in such a movement? That's what you've enlisted in. You know, when I enlisted in the army, I mean, the harassment, the persecution, I mean, it, 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 I didn't like it at first, but I learned some discipline from that, and I'm thankful for that experience. I needed it. <laughs> that was before I was a Christian. Of course, later on, when I became a Christian, praise the Lord, I went on God's mission. <laughs> and I was dedicated to that mission even greater than I was to the other mission. Beloved, this is but a feeble illustration of the experience. We may not truly understand when we enlist in God's army. However, perseverance will not only make you a better man or a woman, 
but an eternally existing glorified man or woman. Amen. I'm looking for the glorification day, aren't you? I'm looking for that day. And beloved, because of the honest, sincere, Holy Spirit driven Facebook Christian, it will become evident to the world that the gospel really can save to the uttermost. That's what our example is supposed to be. We need to be joyful people. We need to have a smile on our face and a countenance that will welcome people. They want to be in your presence, not with a frown. Nobody wants anybody like that. What, what good is Christianity if somebody just frowns all the time? It will prove to, to angels and, and, and to the world that nothing that the evil one can do will shake God's chosen ones. Amen? And those, beloved, who constantly seek his face and are people of the book, again, is what I call Facebook Christians. The plagues fall, destruction on every hand, death staring them in the face. But like Job, they hold fast to their integrity. Nothing can make them sin because we're told in Revelation 14, what does it say? They keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And they both go together. <laughs> you can't have one without the other. I mean, they do this in real time, you understand. Not just in your reading time, but in real time. This wonderful condition requires a serious seeking of his face and a serious reading of his book. Facebook Christians. In the last days, God will have a remnant, the little flock, in and through whom he will give to the universe a demonstration of the love and power of his mercy. And this will be the most sweeping and the most conclusive evidence and demonstration of all the ages that God will do in men who seek his face and read his book. And in the last generation, it's in that generation, and I believe we're in it today, beloved, the last generation of men and women and young people living on this earth that God's power unto sanctification will stand fully revealed. Demonstration of that power. And you know something? It's going to be a demonstration that will vindicate God. It will vindicate God's character. It clears him of any charges that Satan has placed at his charge, at, his, at him or against him. And in the last generation, God is vindicated and Satan is defeated. Praise the Lord. Let me clarify for a moment why that is so necessary. You see, it was imperative. It was imperative that our Heavenly Father allow Satan an opportunity to demonstrate his theories. Why? To remove every doubt in the minds of the angels and then later the mind of man. God must let Satan go on with his work. And for the last 6,000 years, he has been giving the, dem the, the, the universe a demonstration of what he will do when he has the opportunity. You see, what Satan has been demonstrating is really his character and the lengths to which selfish ambition will lead. See, God intends that the last generation be a demonstration to the universe that the law can really be kept. Most professed Christians say that it cannot be kept, as you know. God's law is exceedingly broad and it cuts deeply into the thoughts and intents of the heart. It judges motives. It judges acts. It judges thoughts. It judges words. It means entire sanctification, a holy life. It means a separation from sin. It means victory over it. And this can be a reality in each of our lives as we genuinely seek His face and read his book, a Facebook Christian. You see, there's a battle going on for the spirit in, in, in the in the spiritual arena, and the battle is for the mind of man. And when engaged in the spiritual battle, we must be armed with the mind of Christ. We've got to have it, because the world will take you and mold you right into its web. You see, our mind is a citadel of the will. Oh, that is very critical. 
Desire of Ages, page 324, says this. The soul that is yielded to Christ becomes his own fortress. It's Christ's own fortress. Which he, Christ, holds in a revolted world, and he intends that no authority shall be known in it but his own. Now listen, she continues. Don't miss this part. A soul thus kept in possession by the heavenly angels, agencies is impregnable to the assaults of Satan. Wow. Impregnable to the assaults of Satan. That's Desire of Ages 324. What a picture this brings to our mind. You know, think of it. Our Savior, or rather our soul, I'm sorry, our soul under attack from Satan. Yet Christ is holding the fortress of our heart and our mind with great success. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do we know what that says? Go, come with me to Romans 12 and verse 2. Just a few pages over from where you were. Well, let's read 1 and 2. Beseech, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice. Living? A sacrifice is dead, isn't it? A living sacrifice? Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now look at verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You see, the Apostle Paul recognized the importance of the mind in this great controversy between Christ and Satan. So he urges us to surrender our lives and allow him to transform and renew our thinking processes. Allow him to transform and renew our thinking processes. We're so good at doing it ourselves. He's got to do it. He has to do it. All we do is surrender it to him. Give it to him. I'm going to send it to the repair shop. Renew it, Lord. Put a new diode in my alternator, you know? Make it, make it renewed. I remember a little song. It's not in our hymnal. <clears throat> I think most of you are familiar with it. I call it my Facebook song. And uh, it's a couple of words that I changed in it. You give me that privilege. <clears throat> in the morning, I see his face. In the evening, his form I trace. In the darkness, his voice I know. I see Jesus everywhere I go. You've heard that, haven't you? I'm going to change a couple of words in it, but I want you to sing it with me. You know it, don't you? In the morning, I seek his face. In the evening, his book I trace. In the darkness, his voice I know. I seek Jesus everywhere I go. Beloved, if you and I determine to be Facebook Christians, we will be more than conquerors through him that loved us. More than conquerors. Beloved, my challenge to you can be best expressed in the well-known words of our prophet. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. The Lord is coming. I know that we've been saying that for years, but a thousand years is as a day in the eyes of the Lord. So it's like we just said it over and over again in a way. And in the words of Elder Pearson, we are Seventh-day Adventists, the people of the book. And if there's anything standing between you and that man knocking at your heart's door, by his grace, surrender it. Surrender it. Get ready. Maybe you're lost in this world of technology. Oh, I'm sorry. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Get out the book and seek his face. When you're sitting in a doctor's waiting room. I got I got scripture right here on my, my pad here. On my iPad. But the people sitting in that waiting room don't know what you're looking at on that iPad. 
But if you got your Bible, uh huh. You see, you see, you see what this technology can do to us? Robots. Robots. I don't know what your challenge is, beloved. It may be marriage, maybe your home, maybe your relationship, maybe your academic life. I don't know. Maybe your finances. Whatever it is, turn it over to Him and seek His face and read His book. Let's remember that we're a Seventh day Adventist or want to be, or want to be a Seventh day Adventist. Make that clear. But get ready, get ready, get ready. Let's us, let us be a Facebook people. 